parts. Okay, so for the benefit uh, of those that will be following along, uh, this is the R for Data Science uh, Learning Community. So um, we are looking at the last part of the R for Data Science, uh, the second edition book, uh, which is about uh, communication. And the first part of this uh, section, we'll be looking at Squato uh, and team as volunteer to lead us through the day in this discussion of chapter 29, uh, which is about uh, Quato. So, uh, Tim, I think the floor is over to you. Uh, if okay, thank you very much. Can you see my screen now? Yes, I. But I am just seeing your desktop. I think you need to share yeah. your presentation. There we go. That's yeah, so perfect. That's and, and I have our studio up there as well. If I can, or maybe I can't. <laughs> Go on. That's, yeah, so I've got that there, and then. That's it, brilliant. So I just switch between them like that, can't I? Nice and easy. So basically, as I was sort of going to do the quarto thing and working through the chapter, I thought the, the sort of good practice thing to do would be to try and actually make it in quarto. So um, that's what I've done. So this is basically just a, a sort of a brief summary of what's in the book. Um, so I think I've got the book here um, and quarto here. Um, so this is actually the output of what you get, and we'll be talking about how how this was produced, I guess, following the instructions in the book. So, um, so we're going to look at um, you know what what is quarto, what's it used for, um, and it's basically a, a nice, neat way of writing things or a unified authoring framework, as the book says, and it gives you a place where in one place you can have your code, the results of any code chunks you run, and also the, the words you use to sort of explain what's going on, really, the prose. So you've got everything all in one place. Uh, and depending on how it's structured, it's really good for communicating to decision makers. So that would be people who don't really understand R, who wouldn't be interested in seeing the code. But also you can write documents which are much more code heavy for people to see how you've actually done your analysis as well. So you can collaborate with others, um, and that would include yourself, of course. So you can have a notebook, and it's much easier when you go back if you make notes of what you're thinking as you do the code. Um, and also, you can actually do your data analysis in there. So not only are you recording it, you're actually doing the work in that environment. So that's that's basically what Porto is. So we may as well just um, jump into um, how it works, what it is. So, so the file itself has um, three important types of content. Uh, content. You, you'd normally have a YAML header at the top, which um, does various things. Basically, it titles the document and sets various properties. Um, you can have code chunks in the document, um, and those are actually just um, bits of text, basically surrounded with little apostrophes, forward ticks like that, um, and the letter R, and I, we'll have a quick look in a minute um, at that in the actual editor. And then you can have text, which you've got fairly simple formatting on. Um, so if we have a, a quick look at um, how that looks in the editor, some of that might make a bit more sense. So this is exactly the same document. This is how that document we were just looking at the HTML document we were looking at was produced. So you can see at the top, this is the YAML header. So the very first thing in there, you've got the three dashes above and below marking that chunk. And then you've got various um, sort of statements in there, like a title, the author, the format. So I chose to output it to HTML. Um, as well as that, you know, this is just text and Basically, this is formatted text, nothing else. You can see we've got page break there. Um, that was the second slide. And if I go down, there you go. If I show you the example of the code chunk. So that page we're looking at was generated by a code chunk here. We've just got the three ticks with R in curly brackets starting it and three ticks there. Um, and then we've actually got the code within that. So, so that's roughly 
what the um, document looks like. And you can edit it either in this source editor, which is very much like our markup, um, or there's actually a visual editor, which you can also use, which pretty which is the same thing but slightly different and as you switch between them any changes you make in visual it'll actually be duplicated in source and if you prefer editing in source and go to the visual editor again you can sort of see um the changes you've made in the other part so it's it, it looks a bit complicated at first glance um, and one of the problems i had to start with was just getting confused about whether I was in the visual editor or the source editor and things work slightly differently depending on where you are. But once you've worked out exactly what all the different bits are, it was pretty straightforward. Um, can I get back to, here we go, to this. So you've, we've seen the code chunk. And so this is the output of the code chunk with some text. So if you look at if just, Look at that. That's all that's being put out on that page with the header code chunk example is a brief description and a plot. And if you look here, code chunk example, we've got um, the code which is producing the plot. And then also we have um, the text that you would see in there. Um, it's also done some sort of neat little things that we'll go on to look at in more, de more detail but we're actually able to use code within text. So we have data about a certain number of diamonds and there by using the ticks like that, you can actually use a, bit, a little bit of R that just appears as a number. Um, so if I go back there, you can see apparently the number of rows is 53,940. Um, but basically we've got a nice bit of text and a nice drawing. So that all seemed to work okay. Um, and if I go back here, um, we'll start looking at the individual bits. But is that kind of all making sense so far, all you, Femi? Yes, it's making sense, but uh, I can just add one or two things, but I don't know if you can just screw up, just go up a little bit. Uh, uh, basically, when you were talking about uh, the quarto, yes, no, calm down a little bit. Yes, you can just stop. Yeah, I think uh, you talk about the quarto, which is the extension. Uh, it's always a .qmd file. That means if we do rend click on render in this uh, in our house studio, if you render the document, uh, uh, that means we are passing the entire document uh, to Kenneth R, which Kenneth R is going to process run all the R code, then it's going to create another document, which is .md, which I'm seeing there, which is .markdown, which is going to create those markdown file. Then there is another engine, which is called Pandoc. Pandoc will now pick uh, this markdown file. Uh, it will now render it into the different output formats. If we specify HTML, it's going to output an HTML file. If we specify PDF, is going to give us a PDF file if you want PowerPoint or any other uh, presentation mode. It uh, is going to give us uh, that output. Let me just chip in that. I think we still have Pandoc, which is doing all this trick uh, under the hood. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so let's see, I just skipped over that bit and I, there we go. So if we look at, um, pick up here now, we've got the, um, the visual editor. Uh, what you see is what you mean interface for writing documents. It uses Pandoc Markdown, as um, you just mentioned, and it also has um, buttons so you can add tables and things. So sometimes it's actually nice to add tables using the visual editor um, and you can actually insert just using command forward slash um, or if you just put a forward slash at the beginning of any line, um, that will also insert something for you, you get a choice and you can switch between them so if we just have a quick look at that so here this is we go to the visual editor um go back down to where we were shall we hopefully if i try and put a forward slash in you can see just by typing forward slash at the beginning of a line it's actually telling me i can insert up all these different types of chunks or formatting, tables, footnotes, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things you can insert. 
So at the beginning of the line, just typing that forward slash. And if you want to insert it in the middle of a line, you just use the command and the forward slash and the same thing happens. But obviously if you type it just that without the command in the middle of the line, it's not doing anything. So we've got that. So that's the visual editor. And if we go to the source editor, Um, so this looks much more like um, R Markdown and R Scripts. So the visual editor is a bit more like Google Docs or Word or something to use, whereas this is much more like um, Markdown. It's a good place for debugging syntax errors and things. Um, and there's also help and a quick reference available. And I've forgotten where those are. So if I go back to the book, I can find the book books in here, isn't it? There we go. Issue editor, source editor. So this, this basically is just explaining different ways of formatting text. So by typing symbols in front of the text, you actually get different formats, numbered lists, you can put links in a whole bunch of different things. Um, and if you forget, you can get a handy reference sheet with help markdown quick reference. So if we go back to here and in the visual editor. Oh, heck, can I make that go away? Let's make this a little bit smaller. Is there a help? Oh, I can't find help. Well, your family, can you remember where that is? I think uh, they for they help. If you click on, uh, they help in there at the top of your studio. They supposed to be help somewhere. Oh, up. yes, okay. yes. Help. Uh, R. Then you look at the R docs. There, there. Uh, yes, I think click on there. We would might search for Quato. It's not here. I'm sure I found it easier than this before. Let but... me see. Let me see. In there, will it? Um... Okay, okay, sorry, 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 sorry. Click on the cheat sheets. Where's the cheat sheets there? Click on the help again. Oh, in the R Studio? The... Yes, in the R Studio at the top, at the top. In oh, the R Studio okay. ID. Sorry, help. Yes, click on cheat sheets. Then you look for our Markdown Reference Guide. Ah, there we go, brilliant. That's it. So, so that's explaining how all that, that sort of header one, just yes. you write it like that, and then you get that format there. That's it, brilliant. So you've got a nice little guide there to show you exactly how it all works, which is cool. Um, so, and that's the help in there. Okay, so you've got those two different environments to add in. Is there anything you wanted to add on either of those? editing environment uh, uh there is nothing i want to add uh bill there is nothing i want to add i think you have covered almost all yep brilliant okay so we'll, we'll have a quick look at the um the code chunk so with this so whether where the calculations happen in the document um and you can either insert it um using the keyboard shortcut um, command option insert. Um, you can insert it through the toolbar or manually typing the delimiters and it kind of depends where you are, which works best. So if we go over here, we're back into this document. So if we go to code chunks. Um, if I just quickly try and insert one here. So command Oh, uh, sorry, command option I. 
there you go. And I've just inserted a code chunk now, which is just like all the others. So in this part of the editor, you just insert it in that way. Or if we go to source and we go to code chunks, you can see that's been inserted there. So that's something I haven't tried is, what's it, command option I. Yeah, so in here you kind of just do it by typing the three ticks, curly brackets are, and then put three ticks in at the bottom. And that's, it's done exactly the same thing, um, just in slightly different ways. Alternatively, then, I think you can just click at the top there. You can see, see there are the no, come to the your top right, come nose. You can see a C symbol, C and plus at the top before they run, before they run button. So where are you, we? I think my screen sharing stuff is. You know, you have a run button at the uh, top right. Okay, <laughs> so before they run, before the run button, you see C and a plus symbol, which is like a, to insert. Oh, there we go. Right, got yes. it. Yeah. Yes, you can also insert from there. So if I delete this, that's got rid of that chunk. And then if I just use that, there you go. Yeah, that's a nice, neat way of doing it. I've not found that one. Thank you. Um, so you can do chunks like that. And you can also put in chunk labels. So at the top of the, top of the chunk, you just put hash and then that sort of um, straight line Thing. I don't. I can't remember what that's called. Um, but if you put insert uh, ash, ash, anything called ash is like comments. So when you run the hash, the hash is uh, okay. Yes. But then there's what's yes. what's this bit in, in the? It's like a forward slash forward. Uh, but, but it's a, a vertical a, one, isn't it? It's yes, not vertical, one. vertical. Yes. Yeah. Um, so so that designates all of these kind of um, labels at the top. So you, you can just this the label here is just a name for what we've got. And so it's quite useful to, to actually give everything labels. Um, as it says here, you've got and also I think I can just add one or two. The beauty of what do is that once you put that ash and that vertical symbol, once you hit that, what do begin to show you various options in which you can go into that chunk. Uh, which is very nice. Maybe we are not sure of, of the particular chunk we are looking for. Once we put that hash and forward slash, we can just hit that. What will be? Uh... Yeah. So, it, so it, what, do you mean so just navigate to it using this? Yes, you can go to any other chunk, insert yeah. a new chunk. You can just jump around using this editor here, can't, as well as going to any of the headings and things. You can actually see the chunks. So you can use the drop down code navigator bottom left to do that. Um, and also the names are passed on to any graphics produced by the chunks as well. So you, you can actually, so chunk two was a plot, smaller diamonds, you can see, and the graphics actually inherit that name. Um, and you can also cache them so you don't have to rerun them every time. Um, and there's, there's a funky thing at the top here, which is where, in notebook mode, any chunk name setup will be run automatically before any other code. So you could have a, a chunk called setup, which might be where you download your package and your libraries and things. Um, and it will do that um, at the very start before anything else happens. Um, they've all got to be unique. So you're only allowed one called setup, obviously, or anything else. Um, so that's chunk labels, just using hash slash label and type whatever text you want for the label. Um, so that's nice. Um, we've got other options you can actually use to customize it. There, there are about 60 different chunk options, but if we look at probably easier to see in the source, is it? So, so these are very similar to chunk options and we'll, they basically do the same thing. We'll, we'll have a look at that in a minute. But here you can see all these other things are actually options that are doing various things. So we've got a label, but then we can use things like echo and include. And if we pop back to where we were using, so you can have eval faults. So that will actually stop um, 
the code being run. All the things with X's in don't happen if you use these options. You can actually, so it'll just show the code chunk, but it won't do anything with it basically. Um, if you just put include false, it'll run the code, but it won't show it or um, any of its outputs or plots. Um, echo is quite a nice useful one. So if echo is set to false, it, um, it won't show the code. So you'll just see the output of that code, um, which I think was used right at the start. If we go over to, the, to this plot we were looking at, you can see, we, you can't see the code, but you can see what the code's produced. And that was done by setting echo to false. Um, so there's all sorts of different options you can um, use to suppress different things within the code blocks. And as I just sort of alluded to earlier, you can also have global options, which are pretty much the same as chunk option options, um, but they're put in the YAML header under execute. Um, so here we've got the execute statement, and then we can use any of the options we were looking at. And that actually sets those options for the for the whole markdown file that's kind of like a global setting which you would then have to modify um, separately in each chunk if you wanted to do something that wasn't within your global settings okay so that's code chunks just go back over here and back to where we were as well as having code in chunks you can actually have code in line which is embedded directly into the document and the results appear in code as text um, and you can also use format to make sure that um, things like the precision and the way numbers are written are fairly easy to read so things like you can include a format with um, only showing two significant figures um, after the decimal point or putting in commas every three figures so you can you know that's a difficult number to read but that's a nice easy to number to read because we put commas in so you can see at a glance it's three million not three hundred thousand or thirty million and that's kind of unnecessarily precise whereas that shows nice and neat so obviously you need to be a bit careful when you're using inline code about making sure that the output is in a format that you want it to appear in. Okay, and again, that, that you know, we looked at that briefly. That very first plot up at the top here, you know, those figures are actually generated by inline code; they weren't typed in. So it's a nice, neat way of actually being able to put the results of computations in without having to actually include. The computations themselves. Um, you can very easily include figures. So, you know, graphs, images, drawings. Um, so they can just be inserted or pasted from the clipboard in the visual editor. So if we go to the visual editor and go to figures, probably quite easy. Let's make a little space quite easily insert and then if i go to insert figure or image and then you can browse for any file that you've got in there so you can actually include an image in there very neatly you can have some figures that are generated by code chunks and we've, we've seen the example of plots being used to create um, code chunks and if you're doing that sizing of the output can be a bit tricky you basically got these different options you control within the chunk um, using the chunk um, options we were talking about earlier and you can adjust the size so you can adjust the actual plot size or you can adjust the size it's actually inserted into the document in and that kind of gets a little bit complicated sometimes but you've, there's some really in the book there's some really nice um, basic settings to start out with so what they're suggesting is a procedure where you just set the figure width to six which would be six inches you then you go just go for a standard ratio of 0.618 which is just 
a nice shaped rectangle. It looks good. It's called the golden ratio. Um, and then in each chunk, you can adjust the aspect ratio. So these would be um, sort of default settings, global. And then you can adjust the aspect ratio individually to size it exactly how you want it. Um, you control the output size with out width. So that's the output width. And it's set as a percentage of the output document. So you can hear we've got a figure width of 3.9 and an output width of 80%. Um, and you can also plot in single row various columns using all these different options. So NCOL 2 would actually give you two plots side by side. NCOL 3 would give you three plots side by side. And what that does is it effectively sort of shares out that percentage output width between however many plots you want to produce. So you've got a fair bit of control, but it takes a bit of playing around with to see how it works. But if I see if this will work. So if we try running this, you can see that's actually just produced a plot. And that is, if we go over to the actually rendered document, you can kind of see that's those figures produce a plot of that sort of width and shape. Um, whereas if we say we just made the output width 100, and then we can re-render the document at this point, we can actually see it in here, I think. Probably the easiest way to see what's going on. So that's actually filling, filling up the entire width of the page. But if I set it to 50% and re-render, you can see it's just got narrower. So, so you kind of can adjust the size of it on the page using that output width. And you can also use other options to have things like captions. There I've just put a simple caption um, figure one, vehicles with big engines burn more fuel. Um, and you can see that's just appeared as figure one and the text. Um, and then you can vary the location of that text using this caption location. And that's the code that just generated it. OK, so that's figures. Tables, again, can be inserted using code. So if we go down. That's actually the output from this. So we've actually got the first five rows of empty cars by using that code chunk. So you can just, using default um, data frames, they're just printed as they would appear in the console view. And then you can use NITAR, um, which actually gives you more control and gives you a neater looking table as well. So you can see you've got the same data but we've got a slightly nicer appearance on the page. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other um, formatting options you've got with NITAR as well. So, if, you know, you can actually look at the help documentation for that to see, you know, so all the different ways. And we haven't got time to look at it now, but, you know, you've got a lot more options. And then if there's more options still by using other packages took by any of these to actually put your tables in. Um, and again, you can use different um, chunk options to facilitate that output. So this is basically um, producing the same thing, but in GT. And again, you can kind of see it's very similar because I've not done anything clever, but you get a slightly different output. So there's all sorts of ways you can present tables. OK, how's that so far on your family? Anything else you want to pick up on? Uh, I think it's going well. I think there is uh, nothing. I don't know if uh, the other, from my own end, there is nothing is clear. Yeah, good, good. Lovely. Uh, OK, uh, OK. I think I wanted to let me just uh, uh, add something about uh, uh, I think you are talking about, you're about going to catching. I think this is a very nice when working with the uh, Quattro document because we can have a, maybe 
certain analysis in which we are running and it might take uh, a lot of time. It's always very good. Uh, we do, we can catch those outputs so that once we start, uh, the, the, when we want to re-render that document, uh, uh, a quarter, we don't need to run the entire script when the output has not changed. So the so quarter will just catch uh, that document, the render output, and we will start at the computation from there. I think that is a, also uh, a very useful uh, technique uh, when we are running a such model that will take a lot of time. It's better we use the catching options. Yeah. Definitely. And again, so, you know, I've, I've just not been using anything that takes a long time to run, so I've not really seen that. But yeah, if you're running code that takes ages, uh, you, you can, you can just use those caching um, options to do that. Um, and I think, so to, if you actually want to, to do that, you can do it for each code truck chunk individually as well, can't you? If you use that label, cache true um, for individual chunks. You could maybe just cache certain bits or you could do it in the, the YAML header and that would do it for the whole program. Um, so some sets depends on, you can actually set what that depends on as well, because if you set cache true, but it's not looking at the raw data file, obviously it, it won't know if the, um, if the raw data is being changed. It might only see if the um the quarto code in the document has changed but there are options so you can actually get it to look at the um the actual raw data the files behind the code that you're using which can be useful as well um so you know as it says here NITAR only detracts changes within QMD but you can um use other ways to um, invalidate the cache when changes are made externally. So it all gets quite complicated. And I guess, it, I, I suppose it's something that if you need to use a lot, you'll get good at. Whereas if you're not using it, you know, it's useful to know it's there and you might need to do a bit of hunting around to get it to work. And obviously you can clean out the cache every so often as well, can't you? So that you're not running from data that you first loaded up sort of you know, sort of eight months ago, you might want to periodically use clean cache to actually just um, reset it and run them again to make sure nothing's changed. So um, yeah, we've got the caching there. Um, okay, if we go on to troubleshooting, obviously there's certain, th so we've seen so far that you can do all sorts of things in Quarto and it's, it's really great from that point of view. It does let, increase um, the level of, uh, it's another layer of complexity in troubleshooting and trying to look for problems in your code. Um, you're no longer working in an interactive R environment. You know, we're working through either our source editor or visual editor, and normally we'd be working in little code chunks. Um, and of course you could have errors either in the Quarto document itself, or the errors could be in the R code. So you need to look out for that. One of the really big sources of error is duplicated chunk labels. You know, we've shown how we put different chunks in, but if you're not allowed to duplicate them. So if I just run and add a chunk in here, if I can remember how to do it. Let's do it this way and put in a chunk there using insert. R. So there you go. And then if I put in a header, I'll just try and duplicate a header that I've got somewhere else. Go back up to that chunk. Now, if I try and render it, does that actually come through as an R block? Something looks a bit off with that. I can't see what's wrong with it. Okay, it's that. That's better. So now if you look at that, I've actually used the same label as, um, or did I cut and paste it? <laughs> I put it back where it was from, copy that. 
I'll make all sorts of problems now in here. So I'm not going to do that. I'm making a mess of that. I got label params. Yeah, it was from here. Oh, I've broken it completely. I might just reload this because I think I, I'm not sure what I've done. I might still here. That's not what I'm. Where have I put this? Oh, I can't even find that now, sorry. Um, let, let's go just work through this, I think. Sorry, I was trying to demonstrate something and I've made a mess of it. Uh, but basically, you can quite often duplicate chunk labels. And if you try and render it, it just won't work. Um, so and if you are having problems troubleshooting things, obviously one of the first things you can do is just go back into your console. So if you've got, let's try and render this and just see if we can find. Yeah, so there's, I'm not going to be able to do this now. I've made a proper old mess. I'm like, let's get rid of that chunk. Pull that render. No. Okay, let's just carry on through here. But you can actually try and recreate um, any problems in interactive session. Um, and also you need to keep an eye on the different directories or sessions in there that you're using. Um, so if, and if you set error true on the chunk causing a problem, you can actually get different information out. So I guess if we Googling any of those things would help with finding where the um, problems are. But as I've just demonstrated, really, it just gets a bit more complicated when you're working with code chunks in a, in a quarto document. Um, have you got anything you want to say on that, Olya Femi? No, I don't know. If, uh, I do not know what we were trying to do before uh, you. OK, you are talking about uh, duplicated chunk. Yeah, so what I was trying to do was basically just copy um, and paste a chunk label from, from one place yeah. to another. Um, but I, actually, I think I cut and paste or something, so I've broken two chunks and I can't. I've tried undoing, okay. but no, I don't the problem think is the to... problem is you are still. I think you, are you still in the visual mode or you are in the source mode? I'm in the source mode. Yeah. If you are in the source mode, I think you are supposed you are you will be able to copy those code chunk and paste. I think that probably I've got I've got myself confused because I tried cut, copying and pasting, but I've cut and pasted and then I've tried to undo as well. <laughs> so between that, I can quickly try and if I take this. So I think these were the bits I tried to copy. So if I cut that from there, get rid of this code chunk there. And I think. That come from oh, no, not there. Is that That's, yes? Class that... I need to get the if we have a look in, basically it's copied from the book, so I should be able to um quite easily find it, I think. 
Where's the book? This is the param this is the section that I broke, I think. Yes. So I copy that and then go back here. It was this, wasn't it? Excellent. So that should run that section now. So you yeah. need to load ggplots. If I render it, will it re reload? Because ggplot is in there, isn't it? I used it earlier. The class data is coming from where? Ah, that's a good question. So, right, so it's coming from MPG, isn't it? Okay, okay. So you need to also copy that and paste, then you run that before. Like okay, it's at the top. It's at the top. It's already in your code. Maybe you need to run so that I just want to see if yeah. MPG is yes, and class. Yes, data. if you look at line 318, ah, yeah, yes, you need to run that chunk. I think it's split the chunk into two, hasn't it? Yes, you need to run. Yes, you need to run that 312, okay. that chunk. Yes. So once you run that, you will be able to get the that class that are working. Yeah. As well. Yep, it's supposed just, to work now. Let's just pop that in there. Uh, okay. I don't understand why we put that there. It's just... Supposed to work now. Yeah, don't need that comment in there. No, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be. Let's just copy that chunk again. Well, it's got it in several bits, has it, with these different things. I don't quite understand. Okay, so it's putting comments in separate blocks is what it's doing there, isn't it? It's just, oops. It's there now. Is that right? Is this bit yes. I was trying to do? So you have this chunk and then this chunk. There you go. Perfect. So now, so I think that's that's where we were pretty much. Had, had we spoken about the YAML header? Because I think I've skipped ahead a bit. Yes, I? yes, yes, yes. But I, th I think we pretty much. Um, Looked at. Oh, I've lost my presentation. Probably because I tried to render and it failed. No, okay, let's let's not bother fixing that right now. So if I go to the hashing in the header. So, so basically, in the the YAML header, it's you you can control all sorts of things about the output as well. So with self-contained documents. Things like HTML documents that we use might have other files um, that they use when they actually do the rendering, which might be in a separate files folder in the same directory as your auto folder. So, so these can be embedded into a single document using the option format HTML embed resources true. So that's exactly like in the other code chunks we've seen, but in the YAML header, it actually makes sure that all the information that was it was accessing in these other folders is embedded into the document. So if you're sending a file to, to colleagues, other people you're working with, they will automatically have that or other information that might otherwise have been left in a separate file on your machine. Um, 
And then as we're just quickly starting to look at, we can actually um, define parameters in the header, um, which can be used for running the report. Um, parameters can include R expressions. So here you could actually get um, Lubridate to produce um, a, a date in the right function, in the right format you want. Um, so you can do all sorts of things there. And in this example, it's actually um, using it. So let's go back to the book again. Sorry, I, I got this completely wrong. That doesn't look quite right. So again, if we go to YAML headers. Yes, it's the bit I was messing around with before, wasn't it? So it's, set, it's created a parameter in the YAML header called my class, um, which is SUV. So we can actually use SUV with our with our MPG data set. And it's being used, the parameter my class is being used as a filter. So we're passing SUV into this filter statement. So we're actually only plotting the fuel economy for SUVs. It's not looking at the whole data set because we've actually used that a parameter set there to filter it. Um, and I think we've with a bit of luck, we've still got the plot, have we? No, I've lost it. <laughs> Never mind. We'll just go through with the book. Because um, we're, we're almost there now, I think. Um, is, is that OK on parameters, Olufemi? Uh, so what I want to add for the parameters, you were talking about embed resources equals true. Maybe when we want to uh resend a the html output to somebody we want to uh, touch all the other dependencies in which i also discovered that we can also use uh self-contained equals true in the yaml file we can put self-contained equals true it's, it's still going to embed everything into a single document then we can share that document uh with whoever we want to send it to which will okay, still, yeah. it will yeah. still give us the same uh results does, does it do anything different to the... Um, uh, it does not do anything different. It's still the same thing. It's going yeah, to... Same thing. Just a different command, really, to do. Brilliant. Okay. Um, and that just shows parameters be actually using um, Lubridate to format times and things in different ways, same as before. Right, so then we finally we've got um, bibliographies, citations, references. And um, Quarto can automatically generate these in different ways. And, and the simplest way is, um, is just using the visual editor in our studio. And you can use insert citation. And they, they can come from all sorts of places. You can have um, all these different types of files that you use. You can use searches of different places. Or you can just have a bibliography file in your own um, in the same directory as the Quarto document itself. Um, and it's basically using the Pandoc Markdown representation for citations. And if you actually add a citation using any of these first three options, it, um, it automatically creates that bibliography file and adds it into um, the folder and a reference to it. Um, and it adds the same field again to, to the YAML as well. Um, so as you add more references, obviously the files get populated with, with their citations. Uh, and you can edit this as well using different formats. So I'm not familiar with any of these, but um, I guess if you're you know, regularly writing academic papers and the like, you'd be pretty familiar with that stuff, or get familiar with it. Um, and if you want to create a citation in the source editor, you can just use an at plus the citation identifier that's in your bibliography file and then place the citation in square brackets. So here you can see you can add comments inside square brackets. So if you have just some text, whoever said something, and it will say C at DO99, and there's, there's your references and things in there. If you remove the square brackets, you actually create an in-text citation. 
So there it's just created um, a comment for you there within that thing. But down here, you're actually just referring to it. So this is just, just text you write. And then with that, because it's not got square brackets, you've just got the citation itself appearing. Or you can add a hyphen before the citation to suppress the author's name. So what basically, if you want to say something like Smith says blah, and if you put minus that Smith 04, it just won't give the name again. So it won't appear twice because you've already referred to it there. And then Quarter will render the file and append the bibliography to the end of the document. Um, it'll contain each of the cited references, but it won't contain a section heading. So it's common practice to end your file with a section header for the bibliography. So you're basically just putting a header um, into the document just before where all the, um, the references are placed. And you can also change the style of these by actually using a citation style language file. So, you know, if you've got a certain style that you normally use, you could use um, a, a different bibliography file and a different CSL to define how it's actually printed out. And there's a, a, a load more stuff on that in this link here on GitHub, which goes into that further. So, um, yeah, anything more on that? Questions? Comments? Uh, there is nothing more. I was just trying to get the GitHub repository link for the citation style language so that I can put it on the chat. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for presenting the chapter. Okay. Let me uh, get the repo so that I can post it on the chat. Uh, yep. so, okay. This is the repo. Yep. Uh, if there is no, I think I can stop the presentation. I can put a 